go ahead and get going. So I see if I can get into the screen. Um, welcome to everybody here at the Rec Center and welcome to everybody out there in Zoom land. We're, um, we're happy to have you. We've got a great program. This is my favorite meeting of the year. I love hearing you young scientists and we know that you guys are the future of avian conservation and research. So um, we're thrilled to have you here. After your presentation, we're gonna just have um, some brief announcements and um, there still will be some refreshments over there. So help yourselves. I would like to um, ask everybody in Zoom land to please mute yourselves. And other than that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan to introduce um, our young students. Great to see everybody. I feel like I was just here. I think I was last month. Uh, so this is a great relationship, the 45 or 50 year relationship between the Bird Club and the College of William Mary, especially the biology department and the funding that the club provides for three students every year is uh, might not seem like a huge amount of money, but it is for each student who gets almost $600. It is a very significant addition to their research war chest and they can do great things with it combined with all the other ways that they can support their research. So the, I will remind you that it's usually graduate students who apply for and get these awards, but in some years we have really excellent undergraduates who also apply. And this year we have last year's winners included two undergraduates and a graduate student. So I'll introduce them each as they come up uh, very briefly. But our first speaker tonight is uh, one of my students. She is a sophomore. So she got this as a freshman from Alabama, Julianne Abanoha. And she is on the pre-medical track and she is um, probably best known for her leadership of several of the campus's dance groups, but also for her scientific research, which is really just taking off. So <clears throat> you will see uh, how far she's gotten with the research for which she was awarded one of these uh, research grants last year. Come on up, Julianne. Um, would you like to use a mic? I can project. Okay. Let me just pull up this. Bird Club? Combined. Combined. Got it. Got it. Okay. Does that look right? Okay. And this is just, you know, hit return. Okay. Perfect. Or the arrows, whatever. Okay. Awesome. Great. Did, so if you decide you wanted that. Okay. Yes. Can everyone hear me all right if I talk about this volume? Okay. Perfect. Um, my name is Julianne Abinoha. As uh, Professor Crystal introduced me, I'm a sophomore. I study neuroscience at the College of William & Mary. But along with that, I also do biology research. And so today I'm gonna to be talking about um, songbirds and their relation to their prey, spiders, um, and how those two are involved through ecotoxicology. So a little bit of background. Oh wait, let me see. Okay, a little bit of background. I'm missing a picture, but no worries. Um, a little bit of background about why I chose my research question. Between the 1920s and the 1950s, a factory owned by DuPont situated in Waynesboro, Virginia, uh, was routinely leaking mercury into the South River portion of the Shenandoah River Valley. You can kind of see that um, highlighted by this red or pink strip of river in this map. Um, and what that did was just contaminate the waterways as well as the floodplains, the plants, all of the wildlife in the area with mercury contamination. And what this picture was, even though you can't see it now, was a sign um, warning people not to eat the fish that you get from the South River because of the high elevated levels of mercury um, that they contain. So what does this have to do with songbirds? Well, Dr. Crystal, as well as other biology researchers have been uh, looking for the last 20 years, working with songbirds 
found in those contaminated regions of the Shenandoah River Valley, and they have seen an elevated level of blood mercury content in the songbirds themselves. And this has had detrimental effects on the health, reproductive abilities, developmental abilities of those songbirds. So I've listed a few of those here. They have a decreased chance of survival because of that elevated mercury level. They have decreased reproductive abilities. They have delayed brain development. They have paler bill coloration, which is important for mating purposes. And then of course they have changed singing behavior. So again, all of these um, are detrimental effects to the songbirds found in these areas. Now, what is causing these elevated levels of mercury in the songbirds of this, of this area? Because as we know, they're not fish, they're not living in the river, they're not getting the mercury directly from the river itself. Instead, they're gonna be getting the uh, mercury from their diet. And their diet mainly consists of wolf spiders, as you can see. Now, it's important that these wolf spiders themselves are predators. So that means that our songbirds that have mercury in them are eating spiders that have mercury in them. And the spiders are getting their mercury from other insects. So that mercury just bioaccumulates and gets magnified up the food web to the birds themselves. It's important that these wolf spiders are not web, uh, web builders. So instead of, um, instead of building a web that the birds might get trapped in, instead they just scurry along the ground, which makes them really easy for birds to catch and for birds to predate on them. Um, in the same way, those spiders are able to really like scurry around and hunt for different prey. So we wanna know what are the spiders eating that could be causing their elevated levels of blood mercury content? And really there's two paths um, of prey that these spiders could be eating that could lead to the birds also having a high elevated level of blood mercury. The first path is the spiders could be eating semi-aquatic insects, insects that are born in the river, they're born in the water themselves, they develop in the water, they spend their entire lives in the water. So just like the fish, they're getting their mercury directly from the river, the waterways itself. Then um, insects such as those semi-aquatic insects like mayflies, what they do is they spend their lives in the river and then they fly out for two or three days, they mate and then they die on the ground. And that's where the spiders run and they go and eat those mayflies. Um, so in that way, the spiders would basically be getting their blood mercury directly from the river, the water itself. However, if the spiders are actually eating terrestrial insects, such as beetles, ants, moths, butterflies, those are insects that reside in the floodplains. So those insects don't reside in the water itself. We know that the floodplains are saturated with mercury because there has been routine flooding of the river over the past few decades that has led for mercury to be washed into the soil and to the residue of the floodplains. So we know all of the plants there, all of the wildlife in the area is saturated with mercury. So we know that the, sp that the spiders could be eating semi-aquatic insects, they could be eating terrestrial insects, or maybe a combination of the two. However, this leads to applications of conservative efforts we can take to save the songbirds. Um, if we know that spiders are eating mainly semi-aquatic insects, for instance, we would know that by cleaning out the water of the rivers, we could then um, help with the health benefits for songbirds. We could help decrease those elevated mercury levels in songbirds just by cleaning out the water of the rivers. However, if we know that spiders are eating mainly terrestrial insects, we know that in order to um, help the songbirds from having elevated or higher uh, levels of mercury in their bloodstream, we would instead want to clean out the floodplains. So that leads to my research question. Sorry, got ahead of myself. That leads to my research question. What are spiders along the Shenandoah River Valley eating? And then a subset of that is, are they eating a higher proportion of terrestrial or aquatic insects? And the way I want to answer this question is through a novel technology called DNA metabarcoding. So what DNA metabarcoding can do, I'll give you guys an example. Let's say we have a pond in front of us. We could take a single drop of water from that pond, extract the DNA found in that drop of water, and then we would get an entire list of identified species of fish that live in that pond. The way we wanna adapt that for spiders is by taking a little drop from their gut sample. So getting the gut of a spider, taking a little sample of that gut, we can then extract the DNA and we can get an entire list of all of the species that that spider might have been eating, all of the species that are found in that spider's diet. This is incredible technology because what we had in the past, we could either sit and observe, we could wait and see what a spider is eating, 
or we could go species by species, trying to find the presence or absence of a single species in a spider, which could take forever. So having this new technology is an incredible way for us to very quickly and efficiently find out what spiders are eating. So a little bit of the progress that we've made in this lab. We've begun to work on a review paper. What do cursorial spiders eat? These spiders that don't build webs, what are they eating? We honestly don't really have a clear picture of the diets of these cursorial spiders. So we've, uh, we've decided on over 200 review papers that we are now analyzing to build into one big review paper to kind of, kind of give us a little bit of more background information as to what these spiders could be eating. Maybe we'll begin to see a trend if there are more terrestrial or more um, semi-aquatic species that these spiders are eating. Now, our first step in the actual experiment, experiment of it all is creating a protocol specifically for DNA metabarcoding in spiders. With the DNA metabarcoding lab at William & Mary, there has been a protocol designed specifically for the guts of crayfish, and we had to change that and turn it to work on spider guts. So what we did is we had some frozen spiders that were collected from the Shenandoah Valley a few years ago. They were frozen in a freezer for a few years, and my lab partner and I got those crunchy frozen spiders. We were able to take the abdomens off of them we basically blended up the abdomens of these spiders and were able to um, kind of get the gunk of the guts out of the spiders to then be able to take that, the, um, the insides of the guts of the spider, we were able to purify into just the DNA. We were able to amplify that DNA. And then we were able to send it off into the lab to get reads on what kinds of species those spiders had been eating. And then we were all trained in this protocol as well. We did a spider collection here in Williamsburg as well. We did a spider collection at one of the graveyards nearby. We collected wolf spiders, we fed them all mealworms, and then they, uh, the wolf spiders were killed at different intervals, different time intervals after feeding. Um, and with this way, we were able to send off those reads to see um, how long after feeding that mealworm is still able to be found in the DNA reads. So we know kind of how long of a time period um, post feeding that this prey DNA is still able to be found in the guts of spiders. And then finally, just this past weekend, the grad students in our lab, Max and Sophie, were actually able to go to the Shenandoah Valley to that contaminated portion of the river itself. And they were able to collect new spiders so that we can really get started on the bulk of this study. So finally, just a few more applications of this research. Back in 2016, DuPont um, had a suit and they, uh, they agreed to pay an exorbitant amount of money um, to, again, fund the cleaning of the mercury that was dumped into the South River. And what we know is there are two ways that, this that these conservation efforts could go. They could clean out the waterways themselves, and perhaps that will help the birds, because um, if the birds are eating spiders that are eating semi-aquatic insects, then we know that by cleaning out the waterways themselves, the birds will be affected. However, if we find out that the spiders are eating terrestrial insects, then by just cleaning out the waterways, the songbirds will still have high levels of blood mercury content. So it would be very beneficial to know for conservative efforts if we wanna put our money into cleaning out the floodplains or just cleaning out the river itself. So I wanna thank you all for your support. Thank you all for um, yep, supporting our research and it's been a really interesting project thus far. John, John, Jesus. Well, we'll let's hold our questions till the end, okay? So if you have if you have questions for Julianne, you can think about them. Our our next speaker is Alina Grossweiner. She is a graduate student in her second year. Her advisor is John Swaddle, and uh, she is from, from Chicago, Illinois, and uh, when I asked her what her plans were for after she graduated, she said her plans are to graduate. So I think that's a really good plan right now. Um, so take it away. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right. Yeah, microphone. How's that? Nope. Do you have to hold it? Hold it. 
How's that? Yeah. Ah, I'm a graduate student. I can figure it out. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, like Dan said, my name is Alina. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is my research on polarization and how it might affect bird collisions into solar panels. So uh, as you guys probably know, collisions are a major problem in terms of bird mortality. Um, we think that it could be uh, associated with upwards of 1 billion bird deaths per year in the United States alone, which makes it the second leading cause of death, second only to cats. Um, we know that a lot of different structures are um, part of this death rate, including things like windows, wind turbines, um, power lines, etc. cetera. Um, but there is a new one that we've really only just started studying, which is collisions with solar panels. So we know that there are deaths related to solar panels, but uh, we don't really understand a lot about them. So there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered, including how many birds are dying per year. Um, one thing that's hard about that is the current methods for determining uh, collision deaths, which is uh, just by looking and seeing if you can find the bodies, which has a lot of errors associated with it, and what birds are being affected primarily by this problem. And these are two questions that uh, other students in the Swaddle Lab are currently exploring. One of the other questions is why are they attracted to and crashing into solar panels in the first place, which is the question I'm looking into. So one of the main hypotheses for why this is happening is that birds are mistaking solar panels for water, and that's due to a common feature, which is high levels of polarized light. So you guys probably have heard of polarized light in terms of photography or in terms of sunglasses. So polarized light is created when light bounces off of shiny non-metallic surfaces, it starts moving in one direction instead of many. The important thing to know is um, it can create glare off of water, which is what we uh, use polarized sunglasses or polarized filters in photography to reduce. Um, it's pretty uncommon in nature. In fact, water is the greatest natural producer of polarized light and solar panels actually make even more. Um, it's visible to a variety of animals, not to humans though, but we do know that birds can see it. So there's a common feature that we know exists between these two things at high levels. So we know that birds can see it. We also know that it's being used by birds in certain contexts. So for example, we know that during migration, they use uh, skylight polarization. So uh, polarization from the atmosphere to help orient themselves to direction when they're um, when they're trying to migrate. Um, we also have some evidence that birds have some food and water associations with polarized light. So we know that they prefer sources of food and water that are near higher polarization. Um, this was done in another study with a collaborator of mine with, with bird baths, so in the field. Um, so it's possible that they associate horizontal features of polarized light with water, but we haven't actually tested this in a more controlled setting, which is where my research comes in. So the research questions I'm really trying to get at here is first of all, are they trying to use polarized light to help them when they're identifying or searching for water? And during that search for water, are they preferring sources of high polarization, which might lead them to be attracted to solar panels? So for this study, I'm working with our local population of zebra finches at William & Mary. Um, I have 12 pairs right now, so I'm actually only testing one of them, but they don't like being alone, so they have a buddy. Um, and what I'm doing with them is I'm training them in a, a box that I used with your generous funds to uh, pick a water bowl over one that's empty so that I have them trained to be identifying water. And then I'm testing them um, against different polarization cues to see if that preference for polarization that they may be picking up when identifying water follows through to other things. So this is my testing box. I know it looks a little complicated, but the important thing to see here is that um, we have several perches 
that the birds can fly around comfortably. They have a starting point here with a release box, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, and then there's two points here. This is from when I was doing initial tests with color to make sure that things were working properly, but two places where I can present them with different cues. So in this case, bowl of water versus an empty bowl. And then you can see those little PVC pipes sticking out. Those are feeders for which they will be given a reinforcement. So either food, if they choose correctly, or a gentle puff of air if they make a mistake. Um, this is the box. <coughs> And so what I'm doing with them is training them on empty versus filled bowls. And then I'm presenting them with two tests. The first being presenting them with water, uh, two bowls of water with, who, <laughs> with whose polarization has been altered using filters. So I give them one bowl of water that has high polar polarization and one bowl of water that has lower polarization to see if they have a preference between the two, which would tell us if they're using polarization as a cue to help them pick water. The second test will determine if we pre present them with high versus low polarization, but not from a water source. So in this case, it's a light source with a filter over the top. High versus low, again, does that follow through, which will really tell us, okay, if they are using polariz polarization to help identify water, are they still showing that preference when no other features of water are available? So we know that polarization really is playing a key role in that. As you can see here, here's our nice little release box so they have time to look at things before they get to choose. Um, there's on this end perch here, you probably can't see, but there's a little mark over which if they step over it or onto it, that tells me they've made their choice. You can see this guy here is looking into that feeder trying to find some food. Um, and this guy here is actually looking down at that bowl that I have set up in there. So this was, there's four of them because we have them kind of get used to the box before they go into rigorous training. You got to get, you know, <laughs> some experience first. Um, so the current progress, this per current progress with this is that I'm working with um, a set of birds right now. Um, they're learning to identify water really well. So we've gotten into our first levels of testing, which is really exciting. Um, and so far, it's a little hard to say what's going on, but the, pro the actual training and testing itself is working. So I think we're gonna get some really interesting results out of it. And uh, I'm excited to see what they are. So thank you very much for your support and making this happen. All right, our third and final award recipient and speaker tonight is Kara Hall. Kara is also from Chicago and she is a junior undergraduate. And uh, she started this work with a graduate student last year who probably was also an award winner. I don't remember, Joey DiLiberto. And so this is a lot of times how it works that and I know some of you have helped them with the house sparrow catching, which is continuing with this work. So this is a continuation of a project that was already funded at least with at least one other student. And often our research works that way where uh, some progress is made with one student and then another one comes and takes over the project and so on. So Kara, come on up and I will take responsibility because um, I messed up some of her slides so the movies will not run. Sorry, Kara. <laughs> Okay, I didn't know you guys know Joey, so that's good to know. <laughs> um, okay, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Kara, and I'm very excited to tell you about this project. Um, along with these uh, collaborators, um, I worked on a study on how an environmental toxin affects bird behavior, and also thanks to your generous grant money. Um, so as you guys, some of you were a part of, um, when I joined this research lab, I was put right to work doing some mist netting, capturing um, some birds and it was a really cool experience. I was very nervous. If you had seen the video of me releasing the mockingbird, I was shaking and, um, but I learned a lot. And one of the first things I learned was why 
there were so many avid bird watchers and a um, wild, wild Birds Unlimited storefront that was willing to let us put this giant net in front of their house um, to catch birds. And the reason was that the birds we were trying to catch were house sparrows. Oh, there's a picture. I don't think it's going to play, though. Sarah, can you hold the mic closer? Oh, sorry. Also stand in front of the right. so we can see it. Thank you. Okay, so there's some missing text um, that just says uh, characteristics of house sparrow. Um, and they are not the most popular birds for bird watchers, I know. And um, really anyone who's aware of um, issues surrounding bird diversity and ecology. And that's for several traits that um, house sparrows have. And the first is that they are so ubiquitous around the globe. Um, they can basically be found anywhere. Um, they were introduced to every other continent by Europeans in the mid 19th century, um, mostly to help manage bug populations. Um, and it's the same old story of when you try to manipulate wildlife to solve one problem, you end up with a worse problem. Um, and as you can see, wherever they were introduced, they thrived and dominated and upset um, native populations. This pink dot is actually um, where they were introduced, but ended up going extinct. But that was the rare exception. In most places, they have persevered. Another characteristic of house sparrows is that they are sedentary. Um, they tend to, because they're so well adapted to and rely on humans, um, they take advantage of our structures and our food, and they don't need to migrate, which is a huge disadvantage to native migratory birds. While they are still returning uh, north for their breeding season, house sparrows have already occupied the ideal nest spots. And even when humans try to support their populations by building them nests, <laughs> Um, house sparrows can take them over. And here you can see a picture of, an, of a pair of Eastern bluebirds fighting off a house sparrow who's trying to take over their nest. Another feature of house sparrows is that they are urban. They don't go very far from human populations and they're not the only one. There's so many um, urban bird species. And one thing about them is that they're especially vulnerable to environmental pollutants and contaminants. Um, so these three characteristics of house sparrows might make them common and invasive and pests, but they also make them very good models for studying environmental contamination. Since they're found everywhere around the world, um, contamination in one part of the world that affects house sparrows can be studied by comparing them to other populations of house, sparrowed, of house sparrows, and then we can know how those contaminations affect uh, the other local wildlife. Since they're sedentary, they never leave the affected area where they, there is contamination. And um, that just exasperates the, the effect of it. And they're urban, like I said, so they're in very close proximity to a lot of the plumes that humans put out. Um, another thing I learned about starting this research process is the importance of behavioral ecology. Um, so a lot of people think ecology is just the study of large numbers of animals um, and populations and communities, but there's so much that can be learned from looking at individuals and their behavior. In normal conditions, how animals act and when there's environmental stressors, how their behavior change, changes can give us some insight into what will change in the population um, in the long term. And um, as this uh, person, the uh, Charles T. Snowden, former president of the Animal Behavior Society put it, animal behavior is the bridge between the molecular and physiological aspects of bi biology and the ecological. <clears throat> so speaking of environmental stressors, lead is the contaminant that we chose to study for our project. And um, I think it is another thing that has a lot of misconceptions surrounding it. I personally always knew that lead was bad. It affects your cognition and your mobility and 
basically every process in your body, um, it can affect your health. Um, but I used to think that it was a problem of the past when people naively put it on their faces and on their walls and in their pipes. Um, but obviously it's a lot more complicated than that. There's two main reasons that lead is still a problem. Um, the first is that there's legacy lead. So when lead has been mined in the past and used in production, the amount of it on the surface went from very trace low concentrations to high concentrations. It is dispersed and into the soil and the air and water. And that's not something that we can undo. In the mere 50 years it's been since lead has been banned in pipes and gas. Um, and also as things that were made out of lead corrode and um, get broken down, that lead returns to the environment and is put back into the soil. And Flint, Michigan has been dealing with this problem for several years now, um, where their, their pipes were made out of lead and when their water source changed, they corroded and now there's lead in their water. And despite how much we know about, um, about the dangers of lead, it hasn't been solved and they still are dealing with this issue. <clears throat> Another problem with, um, that keeps lead um, a relevant issue is that there's a lack of awareness of how much it affects the natural environment. Um, for example, bald eagles are, um, when uh, hunting is done with lead um, bullets, bald eagles can consume them when they eat carcasses. And it has had an extremely detrimental effect on the recovery of bald eagle populations. Um, one study done in a raptor clinic in Minnesota um, found that 80 to 95% of the bald eagles they treated had lead in their system and 30% had lethal levels of lead. So this is definitely still a contemporary problem. Um, and uh, that in between of some lead in your system versus lethal amounts is an area that hasn't had a lot of research because um, we know that if you have a lethal amount of lead, that can the lead itself can cause death. But when there's a sublethal level, um, it affects behavior, but we don't have a full understanding of to what degree and what that will lead to um, in the long term. So that's where my study comes in. We use those sparrows that we caught and um, put them into three different groups. The control were not given any lead. The low were given lead levels that would mimic the lead in Flint, Michigan, and the high were given lead levels to mimic um, a mining town in Australia, which has really extremely high levels of lead. We then had the birds perform um, activities, or sorry, assays, to demonstrate their behavior in situations that were relevant to what they would do in the wild. Um, I don't know if there's gonna be a picture. Okay, there's a picture, but not a video. But this is what we called an activity chamber. It was a box with perches that um, a bird would go into, having never been in it before. It was a novel environment. And we would count how much they moved around, how many times they flew and how many times they did a bill wipe. And um, we averaged all of that activity in the different groups um, to compare how lead would affect them. And another assay that we did was flight takeoff. We put the birds at the, um, at the entrance of a box that would force them to fly upwards um, away from the person holding them, which was obviously scary for them, and um, quantified their flight power and velocity. And um, I was, I'm curious what you guys think um, the results of these would be. And given what you know about how lead is toxic, would you think, well, let's have everyone raise your hand if you think that the um, lead would make these birds be more like overactive and use a lot of energy in their activity chamber, exploring and flying, raise your hand. If you think that it would make them more lethargic and low energy and have less powered flights, raise your hand. 
Okay, well, you guys have good intuition <laughs> because that is actually exactly what happened. Um, in the activity uh, chamber, they had less activity levels. So they were hopping less and flying and doing everything less. Um, and in their flight, they had less power and velocity. And, um, and there was no difference between the low and the high levels of lead, um, but there was a big difference between no lead and lead. So this is extremely relevant to um, bird ecology. Just think of how much birds depend on their extremely high powered flight to stay in their social groups and to eat and to hunt and to escape. Um, and if a bird is affected by that lead um, and they can no longer do this, that's going to have really detrimental effects to their populations. Um, and I think it's worth, there's a lot more that's, uh, that there needs to be learned about this and how it translates into the wild and other species. But I think this uh, evidence really shows that it is a worthwhile subject to study. Um, I wanna thank you guys again for um, the grant money and um, let you know that uh, <laughs> there was some artwork on that activity chamber. Um, <laughs> and let you know that the paper that this study was um, uh, on, the, the paper that this study was in is, uh, was just recently published actually. I, this is the title, but I also have a few copies on paper if anyone's interested in having those, um, just come up and let me know. And yeah, thank you again. Now, uh, all three of our presenters will be up front. You can ask some questions. And uh, I, don't, I don't know how you want to manage the questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, if folks want to just raise your hand and ask uh, individuals, we'll just let it go. Is it Zoom? Mm -hmm. Zoom. Oh, and then. Uh, Maybe we can check the chat and see if there are questions on Zoom. We should pass this around so that people can hear. Hi, that was great. Thank you. So I have a question about the house sparrow study. How do you get the lead in the house sparrows? Good question. Um, we just put. Um, uh, lead ions into water, um, and that was their drinking water. Yes. So the question was on um, how they were given lead in their, um, and it was in their water. It was mixed into their water at certain concentrations that were shown to lead to certain blood concentrations of lead, and that's what we were giving each group. Okay, and then I also had a question for the first speaker about your spiders' guts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you said you have to send it off. I mean, who who does this stuff? <laughs> and how long does it take to get your results back? And is that a time warp for you? An excellent question. Yes. Yeah, so the question for anyone on Zoom was, um, I was talking about how we have to send off our DNA samples to another lab to get um, analyzed. And... They were just asking how long that takes um, as well as what that necessarily entails. And the answer is it is definitely a time warp and also an expense warp um, because it's expensive to send all of those um, DNA samples out to a lab. It's in California. It takes a few weeks to maybe a few months. Um, I remember at the end of the last spring semester, we had just finished creating our spider protocol. And then we sent off the reads um, to the lab in California and Professor Skelton, who I also work with at William & Mary, got back to my lab partner and I with our read results um, midway through summer. So it can take a long time. And that's why we also want to do a lot of DNA samples at once, because you don't want to send over lab samples every other week to them. You really want to do it in bulk. So there's a few other meta barcoding, DNA meta barcoding um, studies being done all within the same lab at William and & Mary, and so that we can all send our DNA like in bulk to the lab in California to get analyzed. And hopefully they give you a bulk discount. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Questions for Arena? 
I don't know much about polarization, but can you describe what's the characteristic of solar panels that results in the reflected light being polarized? Yeah, so, I mean, it's basically the fact that it's reflective um, is, is essentially the big thing, that it's dark and reflective, um, just like water. I was just wondering if there was some way you could change the construction of the solar panel to reduce the polarization. Yeah, so actually they've done a little bit of um, messing around with that because um, birds aren't the only things that are really attracted to polarization. So some insects will, like mayflies, will oviposit, preferably on the solar panels over water sources, even though that means their eggs dry out. So they've messed around with that and they found that putting like white... Um, white borders around actually does reduce some of that polarization, but it also, I think, reduces the efficacy of the solar panels. Yeah. So it's a bit of a, you know, really need to make a case that like, hey, this is actually the causing, causing this big problem for it to be something that we could actually do something about. Um, I have a question for Julie. Um, so do you know how far back from the river this um, lead, uh, yeah, mercury. I'm getting my my things confused. How far back from the river do you think these uh, terrestrial insects are carrying lead? I mean, is there a natural sort of cutoff at what point they're no longer carrying it? That's a great question. I think. Um... Dr. Crystal, I think that you've worked on this in the past as well, that there have been studies that I think up to 500 meters from the river, we've tested the blood mercury contents of spiders, um, but we haven't tested further than that. And I think that they were still elevated up to 500 meters from the river. Um, but I don't actually know how far from the river the actual terrestrial insects are still um, having elevated levels of mercury. 500 meters is fairly significant. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that mercury has seeped into, of course, the waterways, but the entire floodplain and all of the wildlife in that area is just saturated with mercury. So right. it's unfortunate. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I guess we can stop sharing and see if there's any oh, Dan? Well, I have a question for Tara. Uh, you're doing more research right now, and you didn't talk about it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, would you look at Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so I decided um, when this project concluded to, as an independent project, uh, with me and another undergraduate who's currently um, studying abroad, to continue to do some research into how lead affects behavior. Um, and there is a study from Virginia, or uh, yeah, Virginia Tech, that found that lead um, affects the, uh, how preferable male zebra finches are to be um, mates for the females um, because of the way that it affects their pigmentation um, and their cognition and their ability to sing. Um, and we were interested in how the female's cognition affects their ability to choose a quality or not choose the quality mate. Um, so currently I am spending a lot of time um, continuing to work with lead, but with zebra finches and uh, looking into how um, produ productive they are in their breeding. And then later down the line, their decision-making, it's gonna be almost like um, Allie's box chamber where she, they, they made a choice, but instead um, with choosing their mates. So that'll be really cool. And um, yeah. What else? Just, uh... Thank you. Yes. I don't know, and this isn't part of your research, but cleaning a river or floodplain yes. is such an enormous, has it been done before anywhere? And how, how realistic is it? Yes. Hmm? Realistically, so that money from DuPont currently is going into cleaning the river itself. And I believe that that has been done before. I don't know to what scale that has been. Cleaning a floodplain would be an entirely different task um, and much more seemingly um, 
yeah, definitely a harder task to undertake. Um, I think same with Ali's, it would take a lot of research to be able to conclude that this is like one of the sole factors um, contributing to songbirds elevated blood mercury levels. And so to claim that as like the number one factor, um, yeah, it would be an enormous undertaking for sure to clean out a floodplain. So. Mm -hmm. And how does it affect too? Right. I honestly I don't know the scale to which this um yeah to this to which this affects human populations. Right. Yes. Yes. And that's, um, yeah, I, the, one of the pictures with the sign about not eating the fish in there, um, was really interesting to me that it's just kind of common knowledge that I guess the mercury is all over that area. Um, and to know, um, yeah, I guess the detrimental effects of that on the wildlife, whenever you go and visit that area, um, I didn't realize like how large of a scale that was. Yeah. I have a question about um, the floodplain and mm -hmm. you know, 500 meters and all that, but does anybody or maybe your compatriots in the geology department done any drilling to see how the depth, how far down the mercury contamination goes? Because the river has been flooding for mm -hmm. decades. Yep. And how, if they were to clean up the how far down, line, how far down would they have to? Yeah. Right. I don't actually know. Dan, do you know if there's a, if anyone's tried to look at depth for the rip, uh, or the floodplains? Well, they sampled soil at various depths, but the problem is it's all agricultural, so it gets plowed under and moved around constantly. So it's not a um, simple problem at all. They also irrigate the whole thing. <laughs> Else? Let me just uh, stop sharing this. Is there any in the chat? Sure. You know, I can close you out here. <clears throat> stop share. Let's see. Three in the chat. Nancy, this is Ann. Yes. Why don't you let the folks just unmute and ask their questions um, instead of worrying about the chat? Okay, I do. I do see three in the uh, in the chat. Question for Alina: When you train the birds, does that impact the results? And then, Anne, yes, I will do that. When you train the birds, does that? Yeah, it, it just. Sorry, it's Cindy. Hi, and thank you, you guys. That was those were great presentations. Um, I was just asking. You, you talked about training the birds, you know, to look for water, not look for water and, um, you know, more polarized or not. So is, does that skew some of the research because you're actually, you know, training the birds to look for certain things and rewarding them? So yeah, how does that impact the, the actual results of the research? Yeah, that's a good question. So what we do for the testing um, while the training's reinforced with either a reward or a slight puff of air, um, the tests aren't. Um, so in that way, we're trying to stop them from like training themselves during the tests. We're just seeing what their result the results are. Um, and then I also was interested in that. And one thing that we're gonna look at is those really first set of results to see. Um, if there's like an initial preference without training, because there certainly could be to just mm -hmm. to water in general. Um, yeah. yeah, hopefully that answered your question. That did, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if folks want to um, unmute yourselves, if you have questions or um, kind of speak up, I can't see everybody who's here but are there any questions from the Zoom audience? No, nobody else? Uh, there was one that said. Uh, Just a comment. 
commented that Cindy clarified her. Right, I was clarifying but, my question. I, yeah. Right, I just wanted to say that all three presentations were so interesting. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. so, agreed. <laughs> okay, I, I think that's it. Thank you all so much. We hope you'll stay for the brief our brief meeting. Maybe we can entice you to come to. Sarah's got Sarah really does have papers if anyone wants if to anyone read wants one of them in a hard copy. I don't think I need that. You all hear me? I don't need the mic, do I? Can folks? <laughs> Okay, well, that was. That was wonderful. Um, they're an inspiration, aren't they? Yes. And I, I, I really want to do meta barcoding with spider guts and uh, it, it just really sounds like a lot of fun. So we appreciate and we the ladies, we certainly appreciate your taking time. You probably aren't too far from exams, maybe. And um, but thank you so much for sharing your your research and your enthusiasm and your time. Wonderful. Uh, we just have a few announcements. George, you want to mention the upcoming field trip? <clears throat> Okay, just one comment on the uh, presentations. Thank you very much. I also thought that the name Purified Spider Guts would be a good name for a rock band. Uh, we got a field trip coming up uh, Saturday to Newport News Park. Uh, we'll uh, be meeting Jason Strickland, our leader there at eight o'clock in the parking lot by the ranger station. Uh, no carpools, uh, y'all know where it is. I did send out a, uh, the Google Maps uh, checkpoint for the Ranger Station in my last note. Uh, let me know if you need it again. Uh, but we're looking forward to a, a good walk on uh, on Saturday. Weather looks like it will cooperate, uh, so we're all go. And I'll just give a mention that the next one after April will be May 18th to Chip Hokes State Park. Uh, there'll be more details in the uh, flyer but we'll need the uh, uh, ferry ride over there. It looks like it was the 7.20 a.m. ferry that we'll take to get over to the park. Uh, Nancy is going to be leading us. We're looking forward to that. Uh, since uh, Chip Oaks is a state park, uh, if you have a state park pass, bring that. And I'll try to also work on uh, seeing if we can carpool uh, over there to consolidate cars. Final thing on that one is after we finish birding at Chipokes, I think we'll be hungry enough for lunch at Surrey Seafood Company. So, okay. Yep. Thanks so much, George. This will be fun trips. Whoa. <laughs> uh, what was the date again for Chipokes? Chipokes is May 18, Saturday. Thank you. Did you get that? May 18, Saturday. Um, and there'll be more coming out about that. That's a heads up. Um, Scott, is Scott on the call? Probably not. This is a very busy time of year for Scott Hemmler. Um, just want to mention that our next bird walk at New Quarter Park is Saturday, April 27th. Um, I'm going to be pitch hitting again for Scott that day. So eight o'clock. New Quarter Park, bring your, it's classic time. So bring your friends, bring your neighbors. The birds are flying. The birds flew last night for sure. I know they landed in my yard. Um, Jim Corliss, are you on? Maybe not. Um, just want to remind everybody that Sunday the 28th is the spring bird count. Um, I think pretty much everybody who's uh, interested is uh, on a team, but anybody who's not, on a team yet, contact either me or Jim Corliss and we'll make sure we get you on a team. Uh, another wonderful time of year to be out looking at birds. Everybody's moving. So hopefully everybody's signed up for that. 
uh, newsletter deadline for the May newsletter is Friday, April 26. And Mary Ellen would love um, a anybody, everybody, um, some folks maybe who haven't done this before, feel free to send in photos, um, articles, book reviews, uh, anything. Uh, Mary Ellen would love to get your content. How do you want to mention our upcoming meetings? <clears throat> well, you'll get to see Nancy again <laughs> on uh, the 15th of May. She's going to talk about her birding in India. So that's going to be a great, great meeting. So the third Wednesday. And then June 26th, the fourth Wednesday of June, we'll be at the Chickahominy Riverfront Park. Um, we'll have Cheryl doing the Purple Martins update for us, which is always a lot of fun. There'll be a lot of great food and just camaraderie, being outside. It'll be nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to call on Patty to lead the May meeting so you don't have to listen to me all night long. <laughs> um, speaking of collisions, um, maybe some of you have heard of the Lights Out program. It's a national program. Uh, it's aimed at urban centers to try and get them to um, get rid of unnecessary lighting at night uh, during migratory periods from 11 p.m. until 6 a.m. It's a bit of a tough sell. Apparently, um, landlords don't like dark windows at night, particularly if they're trying to sell or rent out the space. They want lights. But um, it, it's an effort that's being made and uh, progress is being made. Some cities are I think, um, I think Chicago is one that's uh, made some progress. I know some of the, <laughs> some of the uh, cities in Texas are. And our friends at Cape Henry Audubon in uh, Norfolk are trying to do the same <clears throat> with the city of Norfolk. And so they've reached out to all the area um, bird clubs to see if we would just show support. So we're gonna be on their website with our logo as just one of the supporters. Um, it's a great project, and I'm, I'm surprised that there's as much resistance as there is, but we were hearing the, the numbers of collisions and the toll that it takes. And <clears throat> even if we could just reduce some of the lighting, uh, it would be beneficial. So it's going to be two months in the spring, two months in the fall, 11 p.m., 6 a.m. Um, it's a good band and wagon to jump on if you have the opportunity. Um, an update on our archives. I think everybody knows at this point that we have taken records to the William and Mary Library to be archived there. Um, we've taken a number of binders and uh, all kinds of records and things. We, I did deliver the um, old minutes that Kathy gave me. And it was really cool. I, I did look through those binders before I turned them in. They had, uh, it starts with the original minutes from the very first meeting. And it's, it's just really fun to see who's in it and all the players. Uh, Jay, the archivist, has suggested that we might want to have an open house to uh, introduce to the community that our records are there, that um, if anybody in the community would be interested in seeing them, they'll be there and they'll be available. So kind of a nice opportunity to promote the club and promote um, the community and students to take advantage of, of, the, of all those records and maybe get some good research out of it. So that's um, the latest on the archives. We also have, we were asked by the uh, Virginia Capital Trail Foundation to partner with them in, in some way. They're trying to promote the Capitol Trail. So um, I'm hoping Deborah is still on with me. Deborah and I are going to lead a bird walk on uh, Cinco de Mayo, actually, May 5th, Sunday, May 5th, right, Deborah? Yep. Um, starting at eight o'clock. And I would like to encourage, they're, they're actually featuring it as um, a, bird, a bird walk with the Williamsburg Bird Club. So I would like to in, in, encourage members of the club to come out and join us. Um, I don't know that they're putting a limit on it. I don't know if we're going to get five people or 50 people, but um, it would be fun to have some members of the club turn out that day. It's uh, again, Sunday, May 5th. And we're going to start at that, um, there's kind of a kiosk at the beginning of the Capitol Trail, right across the street from the Jamestown settlement. So um, Sunday, May 5th, eight o'clock, 
Uh, I don't know how far we're going to go. They wanted us to be on the Capitol Trail. So there's plenty of birds right there in the, in the beginning. We don't have to go very far. We might get as far as Mainland Farm, something like that. Anyway, would love to have any and all of you um, participate. And let's see, that is all I have. Is anybody out there um, in Zoom or Deborah, do you want to say anything about our Cinco de Mayo outing? I think you covered it all. Okay. Thank you. All righty. <clears throat> anybody else have anything out there? I think that that does it for me. So we do have some door prizes for the, the lucky folks that are here tonight. So does everybody have a ticket before we start? <clears throat> everybody got a ticket? So we got some, some great things. Yeah. Some bird feeders, hummingbird feeders. Some bird feeders. We got brochures for masters. Now it's a $5 gift ticket to the backyard birders. Some brochures, gift certificates. Puzzles. We have books. We have games, wingspan, and bird watching trivia games. So, lots, of good, lots of good stuff here. All right. <clears throat> the first winner, come take your prize. 327, last three. Is three. Ooh. <laughs> 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 Wingspan, bird watching We have, I think we're calling five numbers. You have a pretty good chance here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fixed. <laughs> the next winner. Three, two, six. Three, two, six. All right. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I told you you have a pretty good chance with five draws. There's five, four. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Three one nine. George. I think George has been a multiple winner. Okay. All right. That's multiple. <laughs> yeah. Did you do five? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. That's five. <laughs> yeah, we'll we do have we have some left over that we're going to save for the next for the next go around. So um, thank you, everybody. Thanks for tuning in on Zoom, and thank you all for being here. We still do have some cookies and snack uh, trail mix, I guess, over there. So please help yourselves. And again, ladies, thank you so much. We um, we so appreciated your work. And thank you, Dan, for, for rounding them up and putting it together. Thank you all so much. Okay, with that, I believe, I believe we're done. Thanks so much, everybody.